Was Mary a perpetual virgin? It's an important question that comes up a lot during this specific season because we just celebrated Jesus' birth. And the important part of that is the fact that he was born of a virgin. It was prophesied by Isaiah. So it's significant. The question is, did she remain that way? And in most of the instances in Scripture where it talks about Jesus having a family, the word that's used for Mark, Matthew, and Luke is Adelphos. And what Roman Catholics in their classic dogmas about Mary would say that um, it says that, they, that he has other brethren and that that's more like the colloquial meaning of brethren. That, you know, like uh, law enforcement will refer to each other as brothers in blue. Or that military veterans might refer to each other as brothers in arms. And that it's more that kind of a familiarity, but it's not actually referencing directly the idea of having, like, I have an older brother and a younger brother that, that were born of the same woman. That... Um, and I just, there's some flexibility, some nuance there that can be offered because of the fact that those instances you have, Jesus then deletes it like, that they'll say, your mother and brothers are outside coming to get you. And he'll say, who are my mother's brothers and sisters? Only those who do the will of the Father in heaven. Right, And so he's even diluting the idea of what it means to be brothers. So it doesn't mean that. Well, there's more to the story. In Matthew chapter 13, I'm going to start in verse 53. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. And coming into his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get his wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is this his mother not called Mary? And are not his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And are not all of his sisters here with us? Where then did this man get these things? And they took offense at him. Now, this is a very fascinating pas passage because there's layers of interest here. The first is sisters. Now, while there is some flexibility for the way that people have traditionally used or colloquially used the word brothers, that, I mean, we still hear this on football fields and other fields like that in spheres, sisters historically has not been that way. That we now in our society, that if there's a woman who's a veteran, we might refer to her as like a sister in arms or something like that. Well, our society is a lot more positive attitudes towards women, including the fact that they even are in law enforcement, paramedics, EMTs, uh, military services stuff. That didn't happen back then. And that in fact, um, they had very negative perspectives, views of women compared to what we view them in that even a Jewish man would stand in the synagogue and he would pray out loud thanking God that he was not born a Gentile, a woman, or a slave. So that you would not refer to another person outside your family, even like a cousin or even like you would not refer to them as your sister if they were not actually your sister because People did not want to have daughters or sisters in their families. They didn't want that. It wouldn't have been viewed as a term of endearment the way that a brother, a father, or a son would be. So the fact that it's referred to here as having a sister, as Jesus having sisters in his family, is strong evidence that Mary probably was not perpetually virgin. Because the same word here, Adelphi, is the same word that's used, like, let's say, throughout the book of John to refer to Martha, uh, Martha and her sister Mary, or Mary and her sister Martha. It's that same word. So it means this, that same thing. 
It's not really used outside that specific context in Scripture. So it means sisters, and that it's additional layers here that it says, where did this man get this women, this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? That's a euphemism, obviously, for Joseph. And is this not, is not his mother called Mary? We have a specific proper name given to his mother, but not to his father. Here in the subtext underneath that, isn't this that dupe carpenter's son and his whore wife? That's what it is saying. And we don't like ref we don't like using that kind of language in reference to someone that is as significant in Christian history as the mother of Jesus, but clearly that's what they're saying. And so in this passage you don't have that same kind of desire to protect the image of Mary that the dogma of perpetual virginity would suggest. They are making a very clear claim against Mary's honor in this passage. Because we know who the mother is, but we don't know who the father is. That's what they're saying. And that... So they are assigning the same matriarchy to James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, and the sisters. They're assigning the same matriarchy there to the same woman, to Mary, that they are assigning to Jesus. The text here is not making a distinction that the dogma of perpetual virginity would like it to be making. It doesn't make that. So it seems like a pretty clear insinuation at the very least to me and then additionally it's important as far as apologetically that imagine like a society that doesn't believe you right that has a very negative perspective about the patronage or patriarchy of Jesus to begin with and then changing their minds so here we have that um, throughout the passages where it says that the his family has come to get him literally like to bring him home that he was making a scene and they were trying to put a stop to it and they were using their family authority to try and coerce him to be quiet Jesus we don't need to deal with this right now he downplays it. They doubted his authority and they doubted his divinity during his ministry, which any family would. Like my, like I said, I have brothers. They would not attest the idea of my divinity. They wouldn't agree with that. They wouldn't perpetuate the idea that I am somehow divine, that I'm a miracle worker, that I'm any of those types of things. In fact, the way siblings are, right? That if I say something, they're going to take the opposite position just out of principle, right? That's what family does. The fact that they doubt him during his ministry, and then in the upper room in Acts, we see Mary, his mother, and his brothers there before the Holy Spirit comes down on Pentecost. And then we also see that James and Jude wrote books of the New Testament, and that Simon, who's mentioned in this passage, becomes one of the uh, bishops leading the church of Jerusalem after the diaspora. So they change their mind and they become, they go from doubting to devoted. That is really strong evidence of the authenticity, the authority, and the reliability of the scriptural claims because family doesn't just do that naturally something supernatural would have occurred in order to cause that change of their opinions and then I think it's really important to note as well that why would they want to prepare uh, as far as Roman Catholics why would they want to perpetuate this idea that she was always a virgin and it's mostly attributable 
to the medieval belief that virginity was supernaturally or spiritually more valuable than marriage. That I mean, the idea that priests and nuns and stuff remained celibate their whole lives as part of their habit and vows, that was a m measure of spiritual discipline. And there's some validity to that. But here's the issue. Mary was not a nun. Mary was married, right? She was married to Joseph. That's part of, it's a really critical part of the math the uh, scriptural narrative of Jesus' birth as well, is that they she was betrothed, but they had not yet come together. It even says that in Luke's gospel and in Matthew's gospel, that they hadn't come together yet. So, um, what they would say is that they take from Paul, where it says that he desires for everyone to remain as he is, single, because it allows them to be more devoted, singularly focused in serving God. Well, there's more to the story than that, because Paul, who wrote that, also wrote in that um, the husband does not own his own body, but it belongs to his wife. And that the wife does not own her own body, but it belongs to the husband. That it's called the conjugal contract, or that's the, the conjugal rights of marriage. That you should not abstain in marriage, but that, in fact, um, if you do for a time for the purpose of focusing on prayer and fasting, then that's fine. But you need to come back together, lest it grant a foothold to the enemy what it says so that Mary being a married woman if in fact she did remain celibate the entire rest of her life she would have been living in disobedience to the conjugal rights of marriage that she would actually be an inferior model of what it means to be a woman a wife and a mother she also, under Jewish law, because that's what they're living under right now, she wouldn't have had the right to refuse her husband. She wouldn't have. In fact, it would have been grounds for divorce if she would have refused him. And that actually comes up in Jesus' ministry of that, was it okay right, for a husband to divorce his wife for any reason? And that... And there was debates about that, but if a wife overcooked her husband's meal twice, not once, but two times, that that was grounds for divorce. Like, it was very easy in those, in those times to just put away a woman. In fact, Joseph even considered it, remember, when he thought that she had been unfaithful to him. So, if she would have been refusing them, that, that would have been grounds for for divorce and there's actually some Catholics that have argued that the reason Joseph disappears from the narrative after the dedication and the trip to Jerusalem where Jesus gets lost the reason he vanishes from the narrative is that in fact they would argue that Joseph did divorce her and that that later passage in Matthew 19 is arguing in reference to that that they're actually trying to drudge up Jesus's family history at that time and that's interesting that's interesting but that's an argument from silence they don't actually have the evidence necessary to argue that we we don't know why Joseph disappears if it's a death or what we don't know but um, it's not enough evidence to justify this kind of a dogma is what I'm saying so, um, if, in fact, they want, the Roman Catholics want to have Mary be this perfect or maximally great model of femininity, of womanhood, of motherhood, and of wifehood, 
then she would have had to not actually be celibate her whole life. That's the crux of my argument. But additionally, I think that um, it's uh, that it's that Gnostic thread in it that borders into the line of heresy. Because if so, it's it's kind of a network of the things that Roman Catholics believe about. Uh, Mary, that she's also the co-mediatrix, that she's also the, these other things that simply scripture can't really reinforce that well. So, um, that they're trying to make her, by flexing the story, into something that she was not meant to be. That there's one mediator, and that's Christ. That by adding her, that adding her into the narrative actually dilutes the value of what Jesus has done as well. That's why Protestants generally don't tend to venerate her the way that Catholics do, is that it's a avoidance or it's a refusal of what appears to be idolatrous. It's the rejection of even the appearance of evil there, but it's also the fact that simply the evidence isn't necess isn't um, substantial enough to justify those dogmas. And that's why, as a Protestant, we do not believe that.